Welcome to Marketplace Live. Let's defy gravity. Hi there, my name is Nicholas Bamington. I'm a futurist and I'm really glad to be here speaking at Marketplace Live with all of you. Thank you so much to Digital Realty and the team uh, doing a fantastic job here. And I'm really blessed to contribute to this discussion. And in my job as a futurist, I help people look out 5, 10, 20 years into the future to create bolder visions, strengthen strategic thinking, and to anticipate risk. And when we were talking about what my presentation could be about, clearly it was going to be about data. But when I think about data, I think about the ability to grow and be incredible, to be energetic and to create companies that are going to change the world for the next 200 years. And the idea of stasis jumped into my mind. The companies that are going to change the world are the companies that truly defy stasis. And Jeff Bezos very famously said that Amazon's a company that always works on day, as day one. Day one, you're always thinking like a startup. You're looking for new opportunities. You're tapping into data, research and development. You're pushing the team further. You're pushing the technology further. And he says that day two is stasis. That's that slow, crawling, linear growth, sometimes not growth at all. And when you get to that point of stasis, you're facing a cold, difficult uh, road to obsolescence, and eventually you disappear. In the S&P 500, the average age of a company is 15 years. So everything changes, and everything changes with data today. So how did I become a futurist? Well, at the age of eight years old, I sat down in front of my cousin's computer and started programming it. At that point, I realized that the world was going to change and be completely different. And at that point as well, I thought, I got to get into this as my career. I got to focus on this at school. I got to get good at this. And I went through school and I read the books and I, I spent my evenings at home working on the computer. And over the years, I ended up getting into university, did applied psychology computing, studied linguistics, artificial intelligence, organizational psychology, cognitive psychology, and really tried to tap into the data that I was finding out in the world to turn that into something usable, something that would help me transcend. And at the heart of my business and every conversation that I have with executives in the companies that I work with, we always start off by saying, okay, you're focused on the next week, month, quarter, year, even 18 months. Strategically, that's sound. But by looking at what is, we're ignoring the possibilities of the future. And I tell them, look further, look to what if the world was different. Really use that as a creative platform to, to push your thinking, to take your team along with you, and to have innovative uh, meetings, design sessions, and the opportunity to really create a future that you want as a company. Because people don't buy what you're going to deliver today or even next year. People buy a promise of what you're going to deliver for the future. Through history, we've seen incredible thinkers, engineers, inventors, and physicists that have constantly challenged their thoughts and focused on wondering what if. Here are three of those particular people that I find to be truly inspirational from over the years. Firstly, I'm truly inspired by the engineering of Al Jazari, a 12th century scholar and polymath. He was an inventor, a mechanical engineer, an artisan, an artist and mathematician. He wondered, what if we apply engineering to automation? And what if we rethink how we can have help in this world, entertainment in this world, and utility in this world as well? In 1206, he released the incredible book of knowledge of ingenious mechanical devices. This book features close to 100 devices and automata that poured water, told the time more accurately, and played music as a band. He really shook up thinking, and he really pushed our, our thoughts forward into the 13th, 15th, and even 16th centuries. Next, I look to Galileo, a true revolutionary in terms of thinking that forged ahead with scientific thought and progress in the face of disbelief through the 16th and 17th centuries. He asked, what if we challenge the establishment? He was a true rebel, a maverick. He was pretty punk rock, one of my favorites. This was the birth of modern science, 
and his research into speed and velocity, gravity and freefall, the principle of relativity, inertia, projectile motion, and applied science and technology really blew the doors off of science at the time. His ideas were so radical, particularly regarding his idea of heliocentrism, that he was accused of heresy and forced to work out the rest of his days under house arrest. And fast forward to the 20th century and to 52 years ago when Douglas Engelbart and his team asked, what if personal computing could boost productivity and change work culture and life forever? Then in 1968, he presented the mother of all demos. It was a 90-minute presentation of a personal computer that essentially demonstrated almost the fundamental elements of, of modern personal computing that we see today. Windows, hypertext, graphics, efficient navigation and command input, video conferencing, the computer mouse, word processing, dynamic file linking, revision control, and a collaborative real-time editor. We use all of these today, especially now that we all work from home. These people and all of the incredible thinkers, scientists, philosophers, and inventors between them challenged how we see the world. They all changed our world, and I see them all as futurists, and they all relied on data and the wisdom that they could divine from it. Whenever I speak with clients, I like to root our thinking as well in what's come before us. I've already spoken about Al Jazari. I've spoken about Galileo and, and the amazing inventions of Douglas Engelbart and his team. But I like to go back to the late 1700s and to the industrial revolutions and the industrial foundations that were put in place. These were foundations across three dimensions. Firstly, communications. Secondly, transportation. And thirdly, energy. And when new inventions and innovations and new ways of working were developed in all of these three areas, and the nexus of them created entire new economies, you know, the five, six-day work week and, and entirely new ways of living, it needs to be paid attention to. And today, our society is based on the industrial complex. And we've seen during a pandemic, it's incredibly fragile. Lots of, uh, lots of things from, from travel and tourism through to the way businesses work and how people connect and communicate have been shaken to the core. And today we find ourselves in what people call the fourth industrial revolution. Communications are hyper-connected, as are all systems. We've got renewable energy and we've got automated transportation. The big promises of a future that, that are wrought with, with challenges around ethics and, and human needs and desires and also responsibility of what we can deliver to people. Now, when we progress in this fourth industrial revolution, we can't leave anyone behind. We have to progress together. And to do that, we have to understand the world. Now, understanding the world seems fairly trivial when we talk about it like that, but really it's based on looking at data and information, knowledge and wisdom. And if we look at this traditional model of data, we can see that the data that we gather doesn't really tell us much, not until we actually translate that into usable information. Now, bringing information together, meeting with other people, sharing that, and creating reporting that, that allows us to look at the world in different ways really creates a foundation of knowledge. But it really starts to change everything when we take our past experiences and the experiences of our peers and we start to divine wisdom. And I like to think of this as infinite, infinite possibilities when we start to look at the world in completely new ways. And at the foundation of that is data. That real-time decision-making on a day-to-day -day basis is the lifeblood of business. It's what stops businesses from falling into stasis. It drives us forward with more passion and drive and energy than ever before. And when we start thinking about evaluation and research, observation and feedback, that comes back to creating even more data in the world. And that data has got a vast amount of use. It's incredibly painful to bring it together, to store it, to distribute that. But we've got more systems in place today, more investment has been made, and people are more used to going through the growing pains of building out a data repository, reporting systems, and a way of sharing wisdom in their businesses than ever before. 
Now, data is growing incredibly. Some are saying in the last two years, more data has been created than the previous uh, thousand years. And, and going forward, we're going to see 163 zettabytes per year generated by 2025. That means all the new systems that are coming out, aut autonomous vehicles, uh, you know, um, industrial drones, uh, suborbital satellite systems, and the such like, are just going to generate huge amounts of data. And we're going to use it to run our cities, our homes, and our lives in ways that are hopefully responsible and very positive for us as humans. But really, when we look at data, and I spent 25 years in this world, you know, we have to work out that craft, the craft of collection, of cleansing, of transformation, and white boxing as well. Now, there's some, there's some new phrases in here. So back in the day, it was all about collection and cleaning and transforming and getting it into data warehouses, getting it available to people, plugging it into analytical systems, optimizing how we undertook marketing or even operate a business and its logistics. Now, white boxing is hugely interesting. As we head into a world of machine learning, understanding what's happening there, opening that black box that we often see, and really understanding the way that machines are learning, how it's applying information, and how we can clean that information that we're finding is really important. And that leads me on to talk about our moral, ethical, and renewable approaches to, to data as well. More than ever, we're going to find that Companies are hiring ethicists and philosophers and organizational psychologists to really try and work out how we apply data both within our organizations, uh, with our consumers, and how we can create a fair and equitable world where the people that we provide services and product to can actually provide their information knowing that we're not going to break that relationship by exploiting them to the nth degree. The new world is going to be responsible, it's going to be equitable, it's going to be renewable, and that's really exciting for me. And part of this, and, and most interestingly, during my briefing for this keynote, uh, we, I was chatting to the team at, at Digital Realty, and they were talking to me about the Data Gravity Index. And when you look at mass and activity and bandwidth, and, and availability and, and reduced latency, we can see the, you know, the back the backbone, the cloud, these systems are going to be the, our nervous system for the world with data as the blood, and it's an unlimited supply, and it's going to change absolutely everything. I'm incredibly excited about this. I mean, you have to excuse me. I'm a technologist, and I, I'm a futurist as well, and I like to mix that all together in a transcendent sense of who we are as humans. And our path from data to wisdom drives discussion, storytelling, and creativity. Then comes true transcendence, a place where the next 200 years will be shaped. Since the dawn of personal computers in the late 1960s, to the internet in the 90s, and the explosive growth of mobile in the 2000s, we've evolved to become cyborgs. We're humans in symbiotic relationships with data and technology. And we're now exploring how we wear that technology to help us to be more productive and connect more deeply with people. Beyond that, we're exploring the dimensions of data that surrounds us. And we're mapping our world to share our context and create immersion in places that we'll share and that you'll likely never visit. This is a new contextualized world where we gamify our environments and seek value in a mixed reality with humans and data merged into a brand new horizon. We're also investing in the field of artificial intelligence with applied machine learning and new techniques to tap into the subconscious patterns in the data of our world and to unlock new ways of thinking to reimagine what sentient beings can be and how they can help us. We're also innovating and building machines at the scale of atoms and molecules to fight our cancers from the inside out using nanotechnologies. And the investment in these areas is helping us step forward into new worlds like quantum computing, where we harness quantum phenomena such as superposition and entanglement to process data faster, break new ground in medicine, chemistry, cryptography, and redefine what we mean totally by computing itself. 
Today, I see the promise of a brighter and more powerful future for all. The heart of what I do is humanity and uh, what we need as humans. We crave certainty, variety, significance, growth, contribution, and a number of other key traits that have defined who we are uh, for thousands of years, and they're going to define who we are into the future. Now, what we need to do is look to that 20-year uh, horizon and start looking out even further beyond. We need to design futures that are fantastical, yet realistic. They can be believable, and we need to design futures for all. Once we imagine the future, we can build a bigger vision, strengthen strategic planning, and anticipate risks today. And to do so, I, I delve into data, but I apply it in whole new ways. This is a particular process that I follow as a foresight practitioner, as a futurist. And when I sit down with the executives to ask them, you know, what if the world was going to be different for your companies? And what if you were to evolve in an entirely new way? The first thing that I do is I ground us in some core principles. The first is humanity, not technology. So really understanding that we don't come with a solution and then understand that humans have to fall into that. We, we come with human-centered design. Secondly, and very importantly, I believe in plurality, inclusion, and equity. That means that we don't try and own the world, colonize how people need to think and operate and work. We, we include them in the process. We give them a sense of ownership and we empower them to do what they need to do with the systems, products and services that we provide them. And then thirdly, the, and the final principle is to ground ourselves in scientific fact and creativity. Now, science is constantly evolving. We cannot confound it. During a pandemic, many people have said not to believe the scientists. Well, ultimately, the scientists were right. And, uh, you know, the virus, uh, it, it's a scientific fact that it's, it's out there, that it's spreading. The rate of transmission is growing in a lot of places now. However, you know, science is, is trying to work to build vaccines to, and therapeutics to deal with that. And there's a sense of creativity around everything from vaccine uh, creation all the way through to running businesses that are avoiding stasis by thinking like startups by using data and creatively using data is something that that I really encourage my clients to do and I encourage you to do that as well try and apply data in many different ways and when you do that and you and you ground it in scientific fact that plurality inclusion and equity and you ground it in humanity you're going to unlock a really beautiful world the next thing I do is a piece of research and I delve into what I call the signals of change. These are things that I see happening out there in the world. I don't necessarily look back in history and, and think about what came to be before today. I like to see what's happening today, what's happening in the laboratories, what academics are thinking and talking about, how science is progressing, what technologies are coming in, and how new ways of working and new platforms and new applications of artificial intelligence and other technologies are really changing the world. World. I then take those signals of change, I understand levels of investment, if they're likely to be winners on the global stage in 5, 10, 20 years. And then I like to speculate exactly the impacts that they're going to wrought on this world. And that brings me on to the second part of my process, which is to, to build out what if hypothetical scenarios, very short statements about what if in, in a particular year, certain technologies or certain systems are put in place and they cause effects A, B, and C with the effects like X, Y, and Z. You know, if, if things were to pass and things were going to happen, what if they actually Then I like to think about the second part of this process is looking at hypothetical scenarios. This is when we really start to apply the idea of going from what is to what if. You know, what if in 2050 we see geothermal energy becoming the standard energy source for 
California and the United States. And that caused the effects of creating a, a huge amount of wealth for, for local economies, an incredible amount of jobs, and a huge amount of renewable energy for, for the US. Uh, and they can sell it to Canada, they can sell it down to South America as well. This is where you can have fun. This is where you can be creative. This is where we sit down and we create 20 to 50 different stories about these future scenarios based on the signals of change that I found to really start to draw out how that new world can look. And that brings us on to the third part of my process is to look through the lens of speculative fiction and, and write, you know, everything from 250 word stories through to larger 4,000, 5,000 word stories uh, for clients before I've written a number of different things uh, for them. And, and really that idea of tapping into disciplines within like science fiction and beyond are incredibly powerful for any organization. And once I've got these ideas, you can really start to divine what kinds of initiatives and projects will fall out of them. And for each of these projects, I like to delve into what are the financial implications, what are the investments needed, uh, what are the uh, gains that we're going to get from a revenue or savings perspective. Organizationally, how does that change how our companies work? What regulations are we going to have to pay attention to, whether those regulations exist today or they're speculative regulations that may exist in the future, we can really delve into that as well. What cultural effects uh, will these projects have? What environmental impacts will there be? Politically, will we have a pushback? Will we have adoption? W what kinds of discussions will we have? Technologically, how does that change our landscape? And what does that do to the data that we create and the ecosystem of data that we rely on as a business? And lastly, I like to look at the social effects. How that really changes the dynamics in society and then we can start mapping out you know the next five years and start looking at those particular initiatives and then we can map out and look out 10 years and start seeing where those initiatives link to other initiatives that suddenly create a huge amount of momentum and then we can speculate what happens in 20 plus years and then from that 20 plus year horizon we can take evidence and then backcast into our process where we go back to the signals, scenarios, speculative fiction, and our dimensions of change. Now, this process has been proven to work for me and my clients. There are lots and lots of different ways of working out there that people have with foresight practitioners. There are many different models. This is just one particular way that I find works because... It's, it tends to work well with existing strategic and innovative initi initiatives. Those initiatives don't get upended by having to stop, do particular activities, and then come back to them or have massive offsites. This is something that can work uh, in situ after really getting aware of what the value of foresight is and how that can impact your business. One of the clients I worked with a few years ago was Vancouver International Airport, uh, YVR, and uh, they needed a futurist to help them tell stories to do public engagement so they could start planning out for the year 2037. You, you may not be aware, but airports do rounds of planning every 10 years with a 20-year horizon because these kinds of investments in, in that infrastructure need that kind of that foresight and that kind of long-term vision. Have a look at what I did for them. Plans for the future of YVR are taking shape. Our 2037 master plan is a blueprint for an airport that'll continue to reflect the best of BC. Sustainable, welcoming, and diverse. YVR will be a feast for the senses, a hive of activity and interaction, a business hub for entrepreneurs, and a unique retail experience that is second to none. Help shape the future of our world-class sustainable airport by attending public meetings and sharing your input online. So I love the project with the team at YVR, and uh, I worked closely with their marketing, their executive, with the PR team that was generating interest to invite the public in to help them shape the future. Now, I wrote five science fiction stories, and you saw the videos that we created there as part of the promotional piece, and they had billboards up all over Vancouver and Surrey and other places in British Columbia, and we invited people in. It was incredible, and, and we used a process that was not too dissimilar to what I use with foresight today 
I still came back to those core principles. I still came back to looking at the signals of change, developing hypothetical scenarios. And the speculative fiction that I wrote were, were very short 200, 250 word stories about real people and the impact on them from new technologies, everything from vertical farming to automation and robotics to biofuels. And I looked across all of the important dimensions from financial and organizational through to environmental and political as well. And this resulted in a huge amount of public engagement and a new vision of what the future could be because we allowed people to imagine what that future can be and what if the world operated differently. So let's think about defining stasis. What are the steps? Well, this presentation has gone through a number of different areas and I think start off by asking what if. Don't get stuck in the now. Uh, really start to push beyond. You know, hire foresight consultants like myself or there's a number of other people out there that do fantastic work that I work with as well. Start to push your boundaries 5, 10, 20 years into the future. Ask yourself what happens when we move our organizational mindset from what is to what if then I need to really make an important point here. Have a moral, ethical, and renewable approach to the data in your organization. It's going to serve you well. Uh, having the ability to have analytics, having the ability to have data analysts, data stewardship, and, and providing data through data gravity and a backbone in the cloud that allows for you and your locations, your, your customers and your clients to, to work together in, in a fast and seamless way is going to create a world of abundance. And think beyond what we're doing today. We may be thinking about linear growth. We may be facing competition. It may be really challenging times, especially right now. Get yourself into a day one mindset and start thinking strategically about that future state. Invest in research and development. Tap into your data and go further with your thinking. And while you do that, realize that the landscape has changed. Earlier, I spoke about the fourth industrial revolution. Now, I think we need to go further. Now, I talk about something that I call infinite humanity, and you've still got renewable energy. You've still got hyperconnected communications and social media and, and news traveling faster than ever before, and new ethical approaches to travel and we're even going into space and space tourism, and that's incredibly exciting. It's a brave new world, but the brave new world is nothing without that extra dimension of ecology and biology. And now we're going to have a whole new dimension of data that's being created. 263 zettabytes of information per year. I think it's just a drop in the ocean. I think we're going to go a lot further. And by going further, we're really embracing that idea of being creative and asking, you know, what if, what if the world changes? Go away from this particular presentation and write five what if statements about your business and then root them in the future to 2030, to 2050. And ask yourself, what if the world was different? And what does your business look like at that point in time? What does your family look like at that point in time? Write newspaper headlines about the future. Bring them back to today and you can really start to create a beautiful future. I love what Eleanor Roosevelt said. The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. I dream in data. A lot of people do. And that data really shapes that future. And that's how I see us all working together to defy stasis and we deepen our relationship with that future state and we bring back evidence and we create incredible futures today. Thank you so much. <music>